Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, in today's class on neoplasia, neoplasia class 5, we will talk about tumor suppressor genes and viral oncogenesis. In neoplasia 4, I told you about uh, Weinberg's uh, principles of hallmarks of cancer and we also discussed one of the most important hallmarks of cancer which is self-sufficiency in growth and we discussed the various growth factors which influence the uh, continuous growth of cancer cells. So, in today's class, we will talk a little bit about certain factors within the normal cell that normally suppress the excessive proliferation of cells. And these proteins are coded by a very, very important class of genes called tumor suppressor genes. And in the second half of the uh, lecture, we will also talk about viral oncogenesis which is how certain viruses uh, can result in the development of tumors. Okay, just to recuperate the hallmarks of cancer, there are these various um, very essential features of cancers that we have uh, uh, talked about and uh, we have especially talked about self-sufficient growth signaling and the second one which is very, very important is that the cancer cell somehow becomes insensitive to growth inhibitory signals. So, today's class will concentrate on the second point which is the insensitivity of the cancer cell to growth inhibitory signals. Right. Now, this very important group of genes which are known as tumor suppressor genes uh, are a very important group of genes that cause the cells, the normal cells not to uh, uh, proliferate in an excessive manner. Now, how do they do this? A normal cell grows uh, and proliferates, but there needs to be a check or a balance so that it does not become too, um, uh, it does not sort of, uh, it grows too much and becomes cancerous. So, there needs to be checks and balances within the normal cells which prevent excessive growth and proliferation of cells. Now, what do these tumor suppressor genes do? They cause dividing cells to enter G0. You know that in the cell cycle, there is a phase called the G0. So, these cells sort of force the cells, dividing cells to enter into G0. Now, sometimes they also cause cells to enter a post mitotic differentiated pool which means they sort of drive the cells towards becoming differentiated. As you know, cancer is a mass of very undifferentiated cells. So, the tumor suppressor genes cause cells normally to enter a post mitotic differentiated pool. They also cause damaged cells to undergo apoptosis. Now, you know that apoptosis is a, a phenomenon wherein the cells undergo physiological death. Now, what happens if apoptosis is inhibited? The cells will not undergo death and they will continue to live and proliferate. So, the, normally the tumor suppressor gel cells cause dividing cells to enter G0. They cause cells to enter a post mitotic differentiated pool and cause cells to undergo apoptosis. Now, you think of the situation where these genes are inhibited. Once these genes are inhibited or disrupted, these cells become refractory to growth inhibition and leads to growth promotion. So, in essence, cancer is a very delicate balance uh, uh, that is lost because the, the delicate balance that exists between the tumor suppressor genes and the genes that promote growth. So, in the previous class, we learned about the growth promoting factors and in this class, we will learn about the tumor suppressor genes. Now, 
it is impossible to go through all the tumor suppressor genes because there are far too many which are implicated in uh, the inhibition of which is implicated in cancer. So, we will just deal with some of two of the most important ones. The first is the retinoblastoma or the RB gene and the second is the P53 gene. Now, the retinoblastoma gene is a very, very important uh, gene, a tumor suppressor gene that was first detected as the name suggests in the very rare disease called retinoblastoma. Now, retinoblastoma is a disease that occurs in children and it is an abnormal proliferation of the retinal cells, immature retinal cells that becomes cancerous. Now, the retinoblastoma gene as a tumor suppressor gene was first identified in retinoblastoma patients. Now, what does this gene normally do? It is also called the governor of cell cycle. Now, as the name indicates, it has a very, very important role in the cell cycle. And because it has such an important role, it understandably, it is inactivated in many cancers. Now, this was the first tumor suppressor gene to be discovered. Subsequently, many more were discovered after the discovery of retinoblastoma gene. Now, there is this very famous two hit hypothesis by a um, scientist called Knudsen who proposed this in 1974. What he said was when both these normal genes, the retinoblastoma genes, as you know any gene has two copies or it is two alleles of a gene. Now, when both these genes are mutated, the disease develops what is known as the two hit hypothesis. Now, biallelic loss as I already said was first discovered in retinoblastoma uh, and that is why it is called the RB gene. Now, we know it is also seen very commonly the mutations of RB gene are also seen in breast cancer, small cell lung cancer and bladder cancer among other cancers. Okay, this is a picture that shows you uh, how retinoblastoma develops. Now, the upper panel shows the sporadic form that is which can occur in any individual and the lower form shows the familial form. Now, there is a familial form of retinoblastoma. By familial, what we mean is the, uh, the patient when the, the child when he is born is already born with one defective gene. So, germ cells of the individual will have one defective gene. Now, all it is required is another hit within the retinal cells for the disease to develop. So, the second hit occurs within the retinal cells. Whereas, in the sporadic form which is shown in the upper panel, none of the uh, somatic cells have the defective genes because it is not an inherited form of the disease. Okay. So, both the mutations the first hit and the second hit will occur within the retinal cells. As you can probably imagine um, in the familial form bilateral retinoblastomas are more common because the first hit is already there it is uh, in a matter of time the second hit happens and it is they are more likely to develop bilateral retinoblastomas. Now, why is this RB gene and its product so important? That is because it plays a very crucial role in one of the most important checkpoints in the cell cycle and this is the G1S checkpoint. Now, what happens is the RB gene product or the retinoblastoma protein in its active form is a hypophosphorylated protein. That means, it has fewer phosphate groups attached to it as you see in the right side of the picture. Now, with the fewer phos phosphate groups attached, it has more space to sequester a transcription factor known as E2F. So, it holds it tightly sequestered the E2F protein. Now, once this retinoplastoma protein is phosphorylated which means it acquires more phosphorus groups as you see in the left side it releases, it has no space to hold the E2F which is released and it is available as a transcription factor and it drives the cell cycle. Now, there are various cyclins, cyclin uh, dependent kinases and cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors which are involved in this very complex 
uh, process. As you can see, the growth factors such as EGF and PDGF will activate the cyclins and cause the active form of RB to become phosphorylated or hyperphosphorylated so that it releases the E2F. Similarly, the growth inhibitors which is transcription uh, growth factor beta, P53 and others will stimulate CDK inhibitors which inactivate the cyclins and cause hypophosphorylation of uh, RB or the retinoblastoma protein and it sequesters the E2F. So, what you must remember is RB gene plays a very important role at the uh, RB protein plays a very important role at the G1S checkpoint. The hypophosphorylated one is the active form which sequesters the transcription factor E2F. So, it is unavailable for the cell to, uh, to go into proliferation whereas, when it is phosphorylated or when it becomes in, in, inactive, it releases the E2F and the E2F is available for transcription. So, if you have the RB gene inactivated, which means the RB protein is inactivated, which means it is hyperphosphorylated, which in turn leads to release of E2F and the cell goes into proliferation. Now, the second gene which is very important is known as the P53 gene. Now, the retinoblastoma is called the governor of the cell cycle whereas, P53 is the guardian of the genome. Now, why does this have such a big responsibility? What does P53 do? P53 is a very, very important transcription factor that inhibits neoplastic transformation by what it actually does is activates temporary cell cycle arrest or quiescence. It in the induces permanent cell cycle arrest senescence and it triggers programmed cell death. Now, it does not do this in all the cells. What it does is it, it, it recognizes any stress such as DNA damage or anything that can uh, lead to uh, uh, integrity of the cell being lost it recognizes it and prevents the cell into going into cycle. Now, you do not want a, a cell that has damaged DNA to proliferate. If it proliferates, it can become cancer, right. So, P53 normally inactivates these cells by either pushing them into crescence or into senescence or as a final step into apoptosis. Now, if this P53 is inactivated, it is unavailable for all these functions and the cell can become cancerous. So, RB gene and P53 both are very, very important and are mutated in very many cancers which is quite understandable. So, this is just a diagram that shows um, uh, the, the way in which uh, P53 works. So, you have um, uh, damage such as ionizing ra radiation, carcinogens or mutagens that can act, act on the cells. On the left is a normal cell where P53 is normal. On the right, which shows a crying face like cell, uh, has a mutant uh, P53. So, the cell which is normal, the laughing cell knows what to do because once there is damage to the DNA, it can either go into senescence or it can go into G1 arrest and uh, if it is repaired then repaired then it goes on into further uh, uh, cell proliferation. If it is not repaired, it goes into apoptosis. Whereas, the cell in which P53 is uh, uh, mutated, if there is DNA damage, it triggers off the P53 dependent genes, uh, the, the P, sorry the P53 dependent genes are not activated. So, the cell is not arrested, even the damaged cell which has a DNA damage is allowed to proliferate and it can become cancerous. So, in summary, the tumor suppressor genes control uh, uh, many of the normal cell cycle uh, processes. The RB gene controls the G1 to S uh, checkpoint. Active RB is hypophosphorylated and binds to E2F causing G1 arrest. Phosphorylation leads to release of E2F and it is available for cell cycle. Whereas, P53 is activated by stress such as DNA damage, it causes G1 arrest and induces expression of DNA repair genes. 
Now, P53 is mutated in some familial cancers and one of those syndromes uh, where it is uh, mutated is known as the Lee Fromeni syndrome in which the patient can acquire various cancers. Now, this is in brief about two of the most important tum tumor suppressor genes. In this session, we will also talk about viral oncogenesis uh, because uh, the viruses which induce cancer, some of them at least, work their way through the tumor suppressor genes. So, the two topics are related. Uh, so, I have combined the viral oncogenesis with the tumor suppressor genes. Now, one of the very important discoveries in human cancer was that we came to know that there could be some viruses causing cancer. Now, this has tremendous implications because one can develop a vaccine against these viruses and some of these cancers now are, um, you know, you know that they can be transmitted because it is transmitted through a virus. Now, among the viruses, as you know, there are RNA viruses and there are DNA viruses. Now, among the RNA viruses, the only uh, oncogenic RNA virus we know for sure till now is what is known as the HTL1, HTLV1 virus, which causes adult T cell lymphoma leukemia. It is a very rare disease, um, common only in Japan and the Caribbean islands, not so common in India. And as the name suggests, this is a virus which is very closely related to the HIV virus. And you know that the HIV virus infects CD4 T cells and causes depletion of those cells, whereas this virus infects the same cells, the CD4 T cells and causes proliferation or the neoplasm of these cells. Now, these viruses do not have an oncogenic gene per se or we do not know yet whether they have an oncogenic gene, but it has been shown that they integrate into the cell DNA, the normal cell DNA and within a tumor, they integrate into the same site. So, it is a clonal process. The HDLV1 genome contains genes such as GAG, POL, ENV, etcetera, which are known in any retrovirus, but they also have another gene called the tax gene. Now, it is thought that this is the ta gene that causes the oncogenic transformation because tax protein increases survival of cells and also increases genomic stability. Now, initially it starts off as a polyclonal process, but later it might acquire additional mutations and becomes a monoclonal leukemia. Now, let us talk about the more common uh, viruses that cause cancer. These are the DNA viruses and some examples I have listed here. HPV or human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer, EBV or Epstein Barr virus, which causes a type of lymphoma called Burkitt lymphoma. It is also known to cause other lymphomas, um, uh, some T cell lymphomas, even implicated even in Hodgkin, and also uh, lymphomas occurring in immunocompromised patients. HHV 8 human herpes virus 8, which causes Kaposi sarcoma, especially in patients who have um, uh, 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 HIV infection in addition. Hepatitis B virus, which is now known to cause hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, all these um, uh, various cancers which are caused by uh, DNA viruses have different oncogenesis or different pathogenesis and uh, we will go into very briefly into some of these. Firstly, the human papilloma virus, very, very important, especially for a country like India, where cancer of the cervix and the oral cavity is very, very common. Um, there are some high risk and low risk types of viruses. What causes cancer is usually the high risk types, which is type 16 and 18. This not only causes squamous cell and adenocarcinoma of the cervix, it can also cause cancers of the anogenital region and some cancers of the oropharynx. Now, how does HPV cause cancer? HPV causes cancer because of two genes, which it has the E6 and the E7, the two important genes. And how do these work? 
the E6 binds to and degrades P53. So, now we just learned that P53 is a guardian of the genome and it is a tumor suppressor gene. So, now by binding to and degrading P53, it causes the DNA damaged cell to proliferate. So, it is not arrested, it is does not go into quiescence, does not go into senescence and it goes into proliferation. Now, the E7 binds to the other important gene which is the RB gene. So, and, is, and it which then displaces the transcription factors. So, the HPV virus works or does its activity in uh, uh, promotes or uh, causes cancer by binding to the uh, products of the, um, uh, the two genes, the two tumor suppressor genes, the very, very important tumor suppressor genes. So, this is just uh, the same thing shown in a picture, the HPV E6 which binds to P53 and um, uh, uh, causes inhibition of P53 which would normally have caused apoptosis, the P53 gene and E7 uh, inhibiting P21 and the retinoblastoma um, uh, gene product which would normally have caused the growth arrest. Now, how does Epstein-Barr virus work? Now, Epstein-Barr virus is interesting because it was the first virus that was linked to a human tumor that is Burkitt lymphoma which is very common in the African uh, countries, but now we know it is also linked to nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, NK cell lymphoma etcetera. Now, it also causes as I already mentioned B cell lymphomas in immunosuppressed patients and how it causes cancer, one of the ways it causes uh, these proliferations is through its protein LMP1 which promotes B cell proliferation. Now, this is a picture that shows how EBV causes uh, Burkitt lymphoma especially in the uh, endemic areas. What is believed is uh, uh, it initially causes a polyclonal expansion of the B cells and after these cells acquire additional mutations and translocations, especially involving the MYC oncogene, they become monoclonal and becomes a lymphomatous proliferation. So, initially it is a polyclonal process and after acquiring additional um, uh, mutations, it becomes a monoclonal process which, which is nothing but uh, neoplasm. Now, the EBV receptor binds to CD21 which is an antigen found on B cells, that is how it, uh, uh, it sits on the B cells and then initially these um, activate the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and kills some of these cells, but then somewhere down the line additional mutations may be acquired which causes it to become uh, cancerous. Now, hepatitis viruses cause cancer in a slightly different way in the sense that there are no viral oncoproteins involved in this oncogenesis. It is an immunologically mediated uh, disease. Um, uh, by this what I mean is the infection with hepatitis B and C causes chronic inflammation, hepatocellular injury, stimulation of hepatocyte proliferation and production of reactive oxygen species that in turn cause DNA damage and proliferation of uh, hepatocytes which then become tumorous. So, this is a slightly different process involving an immunologically mediated mechanism. Now, very interestingly it is not just viruses that cause uh, cancer, we now know that there are some bacteria that are uh, implicated in carcinogenesis and one of the most uh, important ones is uh, Helicobacter pylori which inhabits the gastric mucosa and it has been implicated in uh, different types of gastric uh, neoplasms, both gastric adenocarcinomas and a kind of lymphomas that occur in the stomach called malt lymphomas. This is again is uh, uh, the pathogenesis is somewhat similar to what we uh, saw in hepatitis uh, uh, viruses that is there is increased proliferation of the cells in the background of inflammation. There are no oncoproteins per se involved in the carcinogenistic process in H. pylori induced cancers. So, in summary the viruses causing cancers the most important ones 
are HPV and EBV and rarely HTLV1 and hepatitis viruses that are known to be implicated in hepatocellular carcinomas and the most important bacteria that can cause cancer is H. pylori and they have different mechanisms of carcinogenesis. Uh, HPV um, involves the uh, binding of uh, the tumor suppressor genes, the E6 and E7, they bind P53 and the RB uh, gene and EBV causes uh, uh, cancer due to initially due to polyclonal expansion and additional mutations further causing um, uh, lymphomas and HPV and HCV cause hepatocellular carcinoma by an immunologically mediated mechanism. Thank you.